before uh, starting, I would just like to uh, thank IFCO Tokyo for the invitation. Um, we have had uh, quite a long association now, uh, going back almost uh, since the uh, to uh, talk to you about this uh, at their instigation. At their request. So I'm now going to uh, hopefully share my screen. And uh, can you see that? Properly? Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. So, um, well, this uh, is a relatively recent casualty, but it almost needs no introduction. The picture uh, is worth a thousand words, and uh, thousands of words have been written about it. So, I mean, in terms of the illusion itself, um, this occurred in the early hours of the morning. Uh, we know that there were two blackouts, power blackouts on board. And um, actually, perhaps, uh, fortunately, the pilot on board, as the vessel was leaving the port, he reported the blackouts to shore, and the bridge was closed to uh, regular traffic. Uh, and that was, uh, well, saved a, a lot of potential uh, victims of this uh, disaster. Uh, nonetheless, sadly, as you will have read, uh, six workers on the bridge who were repairing the, the potholes in the road uh, were lost. Now, uh, it looks um, like amazing uh, in, in terms of pictures, but this is not the first time uh, that an, an elision with a bridge has occurred, uh, not least in America. And I well remember this captioned case here, the Morvilla, uh, back in 93, uh, right at the start of my career, um, well, a couple of years after the start. And this involved a uh, tug and some barges going up the Mississippi River in the US. And there was a restricted visibility and the, the tug and barge went down the wrong part of the river and it hit this bridge, uh, which collapsed. And uh, seven minutes later, this American uh, Amtrak um, passenger train fell into the crocodile infested bayou and sadly more than 40 people died. I particularly remember, remember this case because I was working for the PI club that was ensuring the liabilities of the tug and barge at the time. So that was a, a very eventful day uh, in the office, I, although I was not involved in that case uh, directly. So if we look at the Dali, um, it's a purpose-built modern container vessel, around 95,000 GRT, constructed in 2015. Uh, it was built in Korea by Hyundai and had a capacity of around 10,000 TEU. On board at the time, uh, it actually had around 5,000 containers on board. And in terms of the scale, well, this ship is around 300 meters long and around 48 meters wide. Pretty huge. And, and perhaps it's worth mentioning here that, of course, everybody's aware how much the size of container ships has increased over, year, over the recent years. And a vessel of this size was probably not in the contemplation of anyone when they designed the bridge uh, that it subsequently hit. <clears throat> so since 2016, uh, the Dali was owned by uh, ship owner Grace Ocean Private Limited and Grace Ocean as a company is registered in Singapore and the Dali flies a Singaporean flag. The Grace Ocean have quite a modern fleet of 55 vessels and normally as you're probably aware ship owners place ships in one ship owning companies to try to ring fence their liabilities but unusually in this case all 55 vessels appear to be owned by the same company, Grace Ocean. Now, in terms of the claims and, and losses arising from this casualty, um, we've taken the opportunity to list those parties who will have claims. And of course, the owners of the bridge uh, will have a claim for the loss of the bridge, the loss of their toll revenue, and also the cost of the debris removal, uh, potentially uh, will be part of their claim, although the state seems to be paying for some of it, but no doubt they will want to recover those costs. 
Uh, the port itself, of course, the bridge effectively closed the port. Uh, only very few small ships can get in and out. So the port has got massive losses, especially for business interruption. Um, there are, I think, 40 plus vessels trapped in the port. Um, and of course, they can't be traded. So there are significant losses there. There are cargo interests whose cargo is trapped uh, in the port. And uh, some of that cargo will have to be taken elsewhere or, or be stuck. Um, and the cargo interests with cargo on board the Dali, although there is relatively modest damage uh, to that cargo, there's a potential transshipment cost. And also we learned on Friday that uh, the ship owners are declaring general or have declared general average. So all of the cargo on board will face general average claims and also uh, salvage claims. So that's a significant exposure there. And it's worth mentioning that actually in a sort of rough estimate that the cargo will bear around 75 or 80 percent of the exposure for salvage and general average uh, because it's much, much more valuable than the ship. So in addition, claimants uh, might include cargo interests and owners of ships who will incur additional cost in routing the cargo or the ships to other ports at additional cost. So this is not people who are trapped by the port, but people who would have gone to this port, but for the blockage. Of course, there is a loss of life and injury. Uh, in some cases, there may be bystanders who witnessed the incident and suffered trauma. Uh, there's potential for pollution, although really that seems negligible, fortunately. And if you think about it on a really wide scale, all of the commuters or people who use the bridge, uh, they do so because it's shorter or faster and they will face longer journeys and will incur more time lost and uh, travel cost and so on. And you can see that's a very, very wide group. Uh, it could be hundreds of thousands of people. So let's talk about the claims, first of all, for pure economic loss. <clears throat> so um, those claims, of course, there's no contract uh, with the owners of the Dali for all of those claimants. So those claims have to be brought in tort. And there's a longstanding principle under US and indeed English law that claims for pure economic loss are not recoverable in tort unless the claimant has suffered physical loss or damage. So that should mean that the Dali owners are not liable for billions of dollars of claims from the following classes of claimants. And that would be owners of the ships trapped in port, uh, claims for business interruption from the port and other sort of local businesses, and claims from the commuters or general public who can't use the bridge anymore which we just discussed. In terms of the physical loss or damage claims, <clears throat> um, of course, these are in principle recoverable uh, from the ship, uh, should the ship be at fault, and it's difficult to see how the ship won't be at fault uh, for these type of claims. And the largest claims are really the cost of rebuilding the bridge and the loss of life. And so far as the bridge reconstruction claim, that will include the debris removal, the loss of toll income, which we mentioned, and the cost of reconstructing the bridge. Now, uh, with the cost of reconstructing the bridge, uh, you can see that there will be some argument on the quantum of that because the reconstructed bridge is unlikely to be exactly the same as the present bridge. Uh, I'm sure it will be uh, updated and hopefully we'll also have some robust um, protection in case of a future elision. So far as the cargo claims are concerned, <clears throat> uh, the cargo on board will also be uh, affected by delay or rerouting costs. And the delay may impact seasonal, uh, seasonal or perishable goods. Uh, the rerouting of cargo after discharge, so it remains to be seen what they're going to do with the cargo, all of the cargo on the Dali, but they 
may well take it all off. It's most likely they'll take it all off at Baltimore eventually when they free the ship. And then it will have to be taken on to destination, uh, perhaps by another route, depending if the bridge is cleared or not. So there will probably be claims for additional freight there. And you may face some questions about uh, coverage under the cargo policy. Um, I've written here that Dali may declare GA, but as I mentioned, actually on Friday, uh, after this uh, talk was written, uh, GA was declared. So now the question will shift in terms of GA to whether cargo are able to defend claims for general average. And the cargo may face possible salvage claims for removal of the bridge section, for example, that's trapping the ship. Now, in every shipping casualty that's a major casualty, we always look at limitation of liability. And we don't know, nobody knows how much these losses are going to be. Uh, but you can say that the estimated total losses run into the billions of dollars. And as I've mentioned, ship owners do have a right to limit liability. And you ask yourself, well, why does that right to limit liability exist in the modern day and age? And the reason is that that right is a policy, a kind of public policy, because uh, of a desire to promote trade and encourage people to take the risk of operating ships. And also the fact that the right to limit is quantifiable, so you can calculate it, also helps the ship owners to get insurance for those liabilities. And uh, in passing, in many cases, but not this particular one, uh, the overall limitation of liability is based on the GRT of the vessel. So here we're talking about vessel limitation, otherwise called global limitation or tonnage limitation. We're not talking about package limitation or weight limitation under the Hague or hague Bisbee rules, for example. Now, in the US, uh, the system for a ship owner to limit liability and the way that's calculated is quite different to the limitation regime uh, applicable in India or England or indeed in many other jurisdictions where countries have signed up to international conventions uh, which give effectively uh, systems for limitation, uh, limitation of liability. So the US is a kind of, um, well, we can say a law unto itself, if you like, uh, in the way that it does this. A few other jurisdictions do it in a similar way. Um, so in the US, the limitation of liability is based on the value of the vessel, and that takes into account any damage done to the vessel, plus any pending freight that is due. So in this case, as a rough estimate, we may consider the sound value of the DALI was in the region of 80 to 90 million dollars. But the owners of the DALI have commenced limitation uh, of liability proceedings in the US, trying to limit their losses to 48 million dollars or limit their liability rather to 48 million dollars. And the reason for that is they're trying to take account of the cost of repairing the ship and also the cost of salvaging the ship. So particularly uh, releasing it from under the bridge and any other associated expenses. So you can see when you're looking at um, such a low limit in the context of the size of the claim of billions of dollars, uh, we're always going to ask as a claimant, well, is the US limit breakable at all? And if the limit is broken, uh, the owners will become liable for all of the losses, except for those pure economic loss claims, which are excluded as a matter of policy. So then you can see there's a big gap uh, or big difference between the potential uh, limitation amount of $48 million, or let's call it $50 million to keep the numbers round, 
and a potential liability of, let's call it a billion dollars. It's a factor of 20, 20 times. So the question of whether the US limit is breakable or not will be really, really important, uh, to say the least. Now, as you probably are aware, you know, the US is probably the most litigious country in the world, and you can bet that people will try to break the limitation of liability. And for the purposes of this discussion, um, let's imagine that the limitation of liability is broken. I would stress we don't know if that's going to be the outcome. Uh, the case will be investigated in great detail and uh, a view will be taken as to whether the conduct of the ship owners is sufficient to give grounds to break limit but it must be considered to be at least a possibility. But even if, even if the limitation of liability can be broken, uh, the claimants will then still have a question of how do they enforce any judgment or any claim uh, against the ship owners. Okay, you can go and arrest the ship, but the value of the ship might be, let's say, $50 million. And if the ship owner posts security for the value of the ship, the court will probably order release of the vessel against that security. So you're left with the claimants having a ship for $50 million or uh, security for roughly that amount. Um, so then question whether there are any other possibilities of enforcing liability against Grace Ocean the company, the owning company, who are based in Singapore. One of the questions that you will have to ask is whether a US judgment will be recognized in Singapore. For example, uh, a US judgment would not automatically be recognized in England. So it may be that a US claimant will get a paper judgment and will find great difficulty in enforcing uh, uh, awards or judgments uh, above the value of the ship. Then that leads you to the question, well, maybe some of the claimants might bring claims in alternative jurisdictions to try to avoid limitation under US law. Uh, and the claimants may also look at other enforcement possibilities against the other 54 ships owned by Grace Ocean. So for example, they might wait until one of the other ships falls in another US port and then arrest it to enforce um, uh, any judgment. But of course, uh, you can anticipate that Grace Ocean will be alive to this risk and will be trying to do what they can to put their ships beyond reach of any other arrest. Now, we talked about one of the rationale behind the right to limit liability for the ship owner is that it makes it easier for them to get liability insurance. Um, and this is perhaps a good point to look at uh, the PI coverage for the DALI. Um, and the DALI is entered with Britannia PI Club, which is a very well known uh, PI club. It's one of the 12 PI clubs in the international group of PI clubs. And it should be mentioned perhaps that the International Group of PI Clubs or IG is not an insurer in itself, rather, it's kind of a trade body uh, and that performs various functions that are of common interest to all the 12 PI clubs. The power <clears throat> and influence of the PI clubs is not to be underestimated because the 12 members of the International Group together ensure the liabilities of around 95% of the tonnage of the world, uh, world fleet. And in terms of how these liabilities are um, insured and reinsured, uh, the clubs have a retention of $10 million per claim. And then above that, the claims are pooled. So the clubs share every loss above 10 million. It doesn't matter which club has the primary insurance, they all share or take a share uh, of every loss above 10 million. 
And they then continue to share those losses or pool the losses up to $100 million. And then they start to go into the reinsurance program for the international group of PI clubs. Now, uh, this graphic is uh, intended to show, well, it does show the reinsurance program on the international group PI clubs. And I will avoid repeating all of it, but a few interesting points. So here, you can see my cursor, hopefully. Um, you see the first 100 million uh, in a kind of pink color at the bottom of the graph. And then uh, just out of interest, you see oil pollution only provides cover up to $1 billion. Of course, this is not oil pollution. So you go and look at the P&I cover. And then above the 100 million, you look at the first layer of 650 million uh, excess of 100 million, so that's 750 million. That's the first layer of reinsurance in which uh, the club still retain a, a, a line in that too. Then the second layer goes for 750 million excess of 750 million. And then the third layer takes you from $1.5 billion to $2.1 billion. And then the, the, the final layer of the reinsurance program is a so-called collective overspill. So that is special cover, which is for the layer of $2.1 to $3.1 billion. So you can see that if the ship owners are liable and if limit is broken, uh, they will have enough PI cover behind them. It's a, it's a very high level. And also, it is perhaps worth mentioning that even a 3.1 billion isn't a cap on the cover. It's just a cap on the reinsurance program. If they have a claim above $3.1 billion, they start to pull it again uh, between the clubs. So it's a really comprehensive um, reinsurance program. And the reinsurance contract is said to be the largest reinsurance contract in the world. I, of course, don't know if that's true, but it's been said for many years that it is. Um, but, of course, it's a different thing to know that the ship owner has extensive insurance and reinsurance uh, behind that. It's another thing to figure out how a claimant will get his money. Um, and you, your first reaction when you know there's a liability insurer is to say, well, we can just sue the PNI club directly and get all of our money back. But the thing is that PNI insurance is an indemnity insurance, and that operates on pay-to-be-paid principles. So what that means, as, as it says, is that the ship owner, in order to be entitled to indemnity from his insurance, has to have paid the claim first. It doesn't mean he has to pay every claim first. He just has to pay a claim, and then he gets reimbursed for that, and then he can pay another claim and get reimbursed for that, and so on. Um, so this principle of pay to be paid has avoided the PNI clubs facing direct action in many, many claims. Uh, and that's why, incidentally, if you have a recovery claim, it's essential that you get a guarantee from the PNI club directly to make sure you can enforce any liability. Because you won't, in most circumstances, be able to sue the PNI club directly. And this pay to be paid principle has been upheld in the House of Lords, which is now called the Supreme Court in London. So it does mean, as I've said, that directly claiming against the PI clubs without a guarantee is much more difficult. And in many cases, it's impossible. In a few jurisdictions around the world, however, they do by national law permit direct action. And then you have a jurisdiction question because the PNI rules require any claims against Britannia by any party, including a third party, must be pursued in arbitration in England. So in a number of jurisdictions that overrides any right of direct action because it forces you to claim in England. And then, of course, England will uphold the pay to be paid principle. So I think the key point to, to take from this is that, yes, there is very extensive insurance and reinsurance coverage 
available to the Dali, but accessing it as a claimant is another issue. Quite a different issue. Now, it may be worth pausing here and looking at MERS. Uh, MERS were not the owners of the Dali, uh, but they were the charterers of the Dali. And MERS, as probably everyone on this call knows, is one of, if not the largest container line in the world. Their revenue in 2023 was over $50 billion. Now, as charters, of course, they don't provide the crew and they're not responsible for maintaining the vessel, uh, thus purely within the remit of owners. Um, it might be as charters, they are responsible for supplying fuel to the vessel. And that might become an issue if the fuel was off spec and causative of the power outage on board the vessel. Um, but it has to be said that there's no indication that that was the case. But maybe <clears throat> there's a question about Maersk having a deep pocket risk here, because in the US, the only parties that can limit liability are the ship owner and the ship manager. So the charterers um, can't limit liability. Of course, it's a different question to see whether they are liable, whether they are responsible in any way. Um, but it's quite likely, in my view, my personal view, <clears throat> that Maersk may well be named in litigation in the US because the US litigation system tends to name everybody. Um, and in circumstances where the amount of money available from owners is subject to limitation, and even if you break limit, you may have a question about whether you can collect any judgment, I can see that the charters may well be subject to an attack um, by the claimants. And we have seen some cases where the deep pocket has been held liable uh, in any case. So, for example, Total, the oil company, were charters in the Erika oil spill, uh, which was off Europe, off, off the coast of France particularly. There was a lot of pollution there, and the ship owners were responsible, and they did pay up to their limit. Unfortunately, the limit was, I think, around $12 million, and the total costs of cleaning up were billions of dollars. So the French government sued Total and made them pay some billions of dollars in damages uh, to all of the claimants. And we saw a similar thing uh, with Exxon, the oil company in the Exxon Valdez, which was now a very old oil spill up in Alaska. Again, Exxon were not able to limit the liability and were uh, targeted and had to pay billions of dollars out in compensation. So there is often an appetite by the, the state and by the courts to, to chase after the money, so to speak, um, for, for obvious reasons. So, um, I mean, this is the story so far. Of course, this claim will involve a lot of litigation in the US, particularly, I think, by all of the claimants. Um, it will also involve claims for general average, uh, which will probably be fought in the English courts. And there will be claims for salvage. And there will also be a detailed inquiry well, there will be a number of inquiries actually into the loss, or the cause of this loss. So there will be an inquiry by the NTSB, the National Transport and Safety Board uh, in the US, to try to find out the cause of this casualty. Uh, this vessel is Singapore flag. So the Singapore flag state will usually uh, conduct their own inquiry into the cause of the casualty. It may be that they uh, decide not to on the basis that the US will already do that, but that would usually be the case that they would do that. Also, of course, the ship owners' own internal systems will require under ISM uh, an analysis of the root cause of the um, casualty. And so I'm pretty sure that we'll find out chapter and verse as to what happened, why it happened, why it wasn't prevented. Um, 
It's worth noting, however, that some of these inquiries, for example, the Singapore inquiry, you definitely can't refer to in litigation. And actually, if you read the Singapore flag state inquiry, it says on the front page, uh, anyone using this uh, in litigation will be committing a criminal offence or worse that effect. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, they do give the claimants a very good pointer as to where to look uh, in terms of their own claims and what evidence they will need to get uh, to support their claims and what disclosure or discovery they need to seek from the ship owners. So to sum up, um, as you can see, this is a complex web of claims arising from this casualty. Um, limitation of liability will be a major issue. Uh, we can expect that the claimants will strongly, strongly challenge the right of the ship owner to limit liability. And also cases like this uh, give rise to a, a sort of trigger to revisit the question of whether a ship owner should be able to limit his liability uh, to third party claimants. And perhaps uh, it will it will result in the US law changing, perhaps to be more in line with the law in other countries, or indeed to just abolish the right to limit liability completely. Uh, it might be said that in this day and age where there's extensive uh, cover available to the ship owner, uh, that will uh, might be more up to date. And in fact, I believe that there was a vote in the, I think in Congress a few years ago as to whether they should abolish this right to limit liability. And that motion failed by one vote. Uh, so it's on a knife edge before this. And you can see that as the politics change, so that, so that that issue might change also. Anyway, um, we know the claimants will attempt to break limit because it's a 20-fold or more improvement in their recovery. Uh, we know that there's a risk that the claimants will go after deep pockets, such as MERSC, um, to try to circumvent limit. And last but not least, uh, although I'm always on the claimant side and uh, you know the PI club uh, is inevitably our opponent, um, we have to recognize that there is a robust PI system there. So if there are legal liabilities uh, that can be enforced, you will get money uh, from it. Um, and that is actually quite a positive thing. We're not really sitting here thinking the PI system won't have enough money to pay valid claims. So that is the story so far uh, in, a, in a nutshell. Um, I'm sure in another year's time, this uh, presentation will be twice or thrice the length, but uh, it does leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, if you have any, I'd be happy to take them.